All right, so this is the 11th lecture in a series of lectures about creating an international sustainable civilization. Um, this particular lecture, now at the previous two have been on gender. One was quoting from the Quran, Mr. Marif and his view of Islam, how that fits in with Panchasila and Indonesianness, as well as humanitarianism. The second lecture was about Mary Wollstonecraft and a Western view of how to approach the argument, but it also is based on humanism, a natural humanistic foundation. Women are by nature uh, endowed with reason and they need to use their reason in order to live well, in order to avoid, um, in order to have practical wisdom, they absolutely have to have reason. So to deny them reason, either in principle, which is a lie, or to deny them reason in cultural opportunity, access to education is also is unjust and it needs to change. So this particular lecture is about how to be a social influencer to promote women's rights. And I have an example that's from a conference I went to in Indonesia. But the broader issues are the difference between the notion of the responsibility of an educated person to the rest of the society in ancient cultures versus modern. So there is this stereotype that ancient cultures are elitist in the sense that some people have more practical wisdom than others, and they ought to be given more authority than others. Now, that was corrupted because it became related to class. So certain, uh, there were monarchies and aristocracies, and so uh, children would inherit their privileged position in the name of that they're getting conditioned for practical wisdom and the working class or lower classes are not. Now that has been exposed. It's not true. Um, and so the next issue is in the modern world. So in the modern world, in theory, everybody's free and equal, but... Um, Modern Enlightenment thinkers like Kant and Hume, um, Rousseau, uh, Nietzsche, many of them were um, misogynists, they were racist, they were sexist, and they were elitist in another sense. But even at its best, like Kant and Hume, there was this, the notion, modern science brought a stereotype that a good historian or a good intellectual is a detached observer of what goes on around them and what they read. They're not supposed to be an advocate. They're not supposed to be engaged. They're just supposed to be a detached observer and just provide the facts or inferences from the facts. And that that is itself a kind of elitism that you can uh, criticize, evaluate the lack of education of the masses or the way the elite manipulate, but you don't become involved. You just stay separated as if that's the goal to remain objective. And so that's a different kind of elitism, but it's just as toxic, I think, I think it's even more toxic, actually. I think the best model is Socrates, who was just a stonecutter, but he's also Plato's ideal of how to live. And he's very much engaged in public life. He's always asking people questions, people with power, especially about how they use it. So um, I had an experience at a conference in Indonesia, and it brought to light some of these patterns in the way intellectual life occurs, and also the way that the best and brightest people in Indonesia either go to the West and get trained 
to behave and to operate this way, or they even, or perhaps in the best Indonesian schools, they have teachers that were trained in the West. So I, I want to argue that a view of wisdom uh, can be applied today in a way that will promote gender equality better than what we have right now. As far as I know, again, how much do I know? But based on my experience. Um, okay, so some experiences we have seem to follow patterns more than others. Um, and I think if you are educated in ancient wisdom, you, the tragedies, the comedies, the myths, they all um, present certain types of situations that people get into uh, just because it's the human condition or certain types of personalities that relate to these types of situations in certain types of ways. So there's a pattern and that's how you can learn and you can become a more engaged citizen. You can contribute more, you can be wiser. So not every event is just uh, unique to you or completely existential. So existentialism would say that everything that happens to you is absolutely unique. Everybody has a totally different existence. Well, you can't learn much then. Um, but this particular conference to me was important because I think the way I understand it is that it represented a pattern. It was a lot more meaningful, more important than just some random event that happens, which we have plenty of those too in life. Um, just learning how to separate um, what's important from what's not in the circumstances of your life. So that again is a switch from an enlightenment paradigm because this is not dualistic thinking and it's not reductionistic, materialistic, moral relativism kind of thinking. It's really taking that capacity for pattern recognition and the human condition, taking that from the, the ancient wisdom and bringing it into uh, our life today in the formation of a systems view, a sustainable systems view of culture. All right, so here we are. Um, Panchasila number four is democracy guided by the inner wisdom in the unanimity arising out of deliberations among representatives. So this is, an, uh, this one really struck me when I first read it because it is so Aristotelian. Um, the art of deliberation is practical wisdom. And this is not at all my country's ideology in the Declaration of Independence. So I, I was very impressed with that. It also fits perfectly with religious pluralism and humanism, especially when I thought of that as Greek humanism. So there is an intellectual climate of dialogue in Indonesia. Many foundations organize public venues of interfaith dialogue. So interfaith dialogue is a thing in Indonesia, and that combines um, ancient humanism with religious pluralism. Um, Indonesian leaders want citizens to recognize their common humanity beneath or above their different religious beliefs and rituals. That's what comes out in these interfaith dialogues is that we have a common humanity. That's why we can have a meaningful dialogue. This presentation uses one example as a model for how Indonesians could use their awareness of the power of social media in Indonesia to address a social problem, specifically the problem of fathers arranging to have their daughters get married without their consent and when they're young. These young women have to leave school, have no way to provide for themselves, is they are abused by their husbands or in-laws, if they are abused. It's a widespread problem throughout the developing world. So I'm not quite sure how common it is in Indonesia, but I taught in Bangladesh and it was very common in Bangladesh. The majority 
of marriages are arranged. So most of my students, and it was an excellent college, their siblings, their sisters, their aunts, their mothers, my gosh, so many huge high percentage had arranged marriages. Um, just to tell a funny story, like the first week I was teaching there in Bangladesh, it was an all women's college. I was teaching about the myth of Psyche and Eros, and that's about falling in love with love. You fall in love with the feeling of being in love. And um, you don't really know the character of the person that you're married, you're about to marry. And so I said to them, when you go to a wedding, do you wonder if these people are really in love with the feeling of being in love or if they really understand the character of the person? And it was so funny because the students looked at each other and they looked at me and they said, Professor Beck, the weddings we go to are all arranged. <laughs> and I just like, oh my gosh, it didn't even cross my mind. Honestly, it did not cross my mind. I had no idea that that was still happening. I, you know, there's a lot of things I didn't know. And why didn't I know? You don't get rewarded for it professionally. And you have a lot of duties and a lot of distractions. Who's ever going to have fine time to think about all these things? But anyway, so that was great. Very enlightening. Um, so... That's that's what I want to tackle now. If someone wants to be, okay, the other thing, my colleagues in Indonesia, but the students in Bangladesh, it wasn't that bad in 2012, but it's gotten a lot worse. Um, they say that the students are just addicted to social media and they're very much influenced by social media influencers and it really is undermining um, the education, the ability, excuse me, Indonesia to um, to develop, because in order to develop, you've got to have people who know English, who develop expertise, and if the students are on social media all the time, they they're not going to learn English, and they're not going to be able to really make a good professional contribution to compete with other countries to get Indonesians to be able to compete in the economic system that requires English and high tech skills. If they're all on social media, this is this is a real problem. So if someone so how do you do that? So one thing you could do is sort of figure out how could I be a social media influencer to try to influence people to get an education to get off social media or some other way that I could actually make a difference rather than just avoiding it. Now I myself avoid it, but you know, I had an idea for how I could encourage my colleagues who are get discouraged, how they could play the game and actually use it to make their country a better place. Um, all right, if someone wants to be a social media influencer who wants to bring about positive social change, they have to understand the people involved, their hopes, their fears, their cultural situation, and why they make the choices they make. This is where, again, the Greek view of education, public education, when you go and watch the tragedies or the comedies, the point of all of that art and the myth was empathy, that you can identify with those characters. So, for example, one of the characters, um, Clytemestra, she's the queen, and Agamemnon has to kill their oldest daughter before he goes off to war, and he comes back, and um, she stabs him to death. Well, of course, that sounds horrible, you stab your husband to death. He's also the king. And so you're putting the whole city in a state of chaos. And, you know, it sounds awful. But if you uh, attend the play and you understand, you can empathize with Clytemestra. You can understand her point of view and what her, how arrogant he was, 
how ignorant, how insensitive to her and all this stuff. And so the whole point is all of those characters in the tragedy, the ones that are the worst, the ones that are the best. And there's, there's some of them that no reasonable person would want to identify with but they need to identify there really are people who are that wicked. So the whole process is to learn how to understand character, to learn to understand your own character, and to learn how to empathize. If I had grown up in that situation, would I maybe give in to that rather than judging it? So um, if you want to be a social media influence, I think you should decide you want to have empathy. It's one of your goals, right? It's not one of my goals, but it could be a goal of someone who is a college professor to figure out how to use social media to actually have an influence. Start having a meaningful dialogue with people. And the process should be driven by inner wisdom, which comes from respect for others. So you can say, you know, I'm on social media because I'm trying to really make good on Ponchicilla number four and to have dialogue with other Indonesians from many other points of view, understandings, traditions, whatever. In this case, the influencer should begin with the assumption, if you want to change this problem of child marriage, you have to begin with the assumption that parents want what is best for their daughters. They're not wicked people. You know, you could judge them, but you're never going to change anybody's mind if you just judge people and you think they're uneducated and they have this blind faith and they're irrational. Why don't you just assume that they have reasons? They actually are rational. They're human beings. They have they want what's best for their daughters. They just happen to think this is what's best. They fear poverty, often based on experience. So who are you as a highly educated college professor to thumb your nose at somebody who's afraid of poverty, who lives in poverty? If you were poor, you'd worry too. They want their daughters to be taken care of. Arranging for their marriage is the best way they know of to provide for them over a lifetime. Let's assume they're not trying to harm their daughters, they're trying to help their daughters. So develop empathy. If you were in that situation, you would do the same thing. Okay, so what happened in my experience? How the most highly respected Indonesian experts in the field addressed the problem. So in, in 2022, I attended a conference there were two researchers in one of the top universities in Indonesia, gave very sophisticated PowerPoint presentations, way fancier than mine. I mean, mine is just an argument. Oh, they had all these smells and bells and all these fancy things. Um, one of them had like 44 slides and oh my gosh, you just cannot. There's no way your brain can take in all that information. Um, they had the facts straight, the average age, the numbers, where they lived. They listed what was being done, which making uh, stricter laws against child marriage, making sure the judges applied the laws, making sure the politicians who appointed the judges wanted to stop the practice. So they wanted the system to be effective and efficient, but they didn't make any effort Um this is objective, detached observer, right? He sees the problem. He wants the society to address these problems on the model of a rational, efficient, well-run social machine. So this is the model of the machinery of society, institutions, bureaucracies as machines. And I will get into that later because that model is is damaging it's a major factor in why we have an economic system that's destroying life on earth is we keep using the mechanistic machine model of culture and human institutions so this is their model they're going on um the difference 
between my approach to become a, a social influencer and the professors who took this approach has its root in the difference between the ancient model of the philosopher as the lover of wisdom and the modern Western model of the person, the expert in knowledge who wants to create uh, an efficient uh, social social um, social con conditioning, right? Social engineering. Let's re-engineer the, the system, making sure that all the parts fit together. And so these fathers will be forced. They'll be caught. Maybe they'll be arrested, whatever. The paradigm of the philosopher in Western antiquity was Socrates. He was engaged in dialogue every day with everyone he met, asking them what they think justice is, what virtue is, what truth is, what beauty is, and most of all, what's the best human life? When they answered, he asked follow-up questions, making them accountable. He did not detach himself. He did not look at people as numbers or statistics, and he did not try to use force, you know, a legal system with punishments and rewards. That's behavior modification. He tried to reason with them about their idea of the good, how to live. Further, Plato's dialogue show us, and this is what I think the, the founders of Panchasilla they had that in mind. They didn't just have Aristotle in mind. Uh, Socrates is the classic dialectician. They show us that the worldviews each of Socrates' interlocutors have in the dialogues were what drove them in their lives. Their entire way of life was driven by this view, how they answered his questions. When Socrates pointed out a flaw in their view, the interlocutor did not change his mind. Instead, he went out and made mistakes in judgment at a critical time, leading himself in the city of Athens to destruction. So the very flaw in the argument turned out to be a flaw in the choice they made that was a critical choice in their life and in the life of the city. The model here is of the philosopher as a very engaged, very engaged in public life, a person who above all others tries to get citizens to live examined lives and save their democracy. He's trying to be a so-called social influencer, although he just gets hated and eventually killed. But instead of pandering to people and becoming popular, he cross-examines people and exposes their ignorance. But mostly he cross-examines the privileged, like in this case, you would cross-examine the professors who come in there with their PowerPoints and figure out how to make a more efficient machine and use it to force the poor uh, to conform. Um, so he would ask, I think he would ask the elite, the, the educated elite, the questions first before asking the fathers. So... Aristotle's model of the wise person is the one who's actively exercising all of her natural capacities, social, political, intellectual, personal, to live a complete life at every stage of life. 20% of Aristotle's ethics is about friendships, which means all sorts of relationship. It doesn't mean friendships in the way that we mean it in English. It means your relationships, like your bond with the person at the grocery store who checks out your groceries or the bond you have with the person who, you know, cleans your office. Just everybody, every relationship is a kind of friendship. If we want to be fully human, we should relate to people in many walks of life, engaging in meaningful dialogue about all aspects of social life. I think that is what the authors of Penchicilla had in mind. People who are engaged in dialogue to solve problems that are specific to the realm of political life need to also be engaged in the same level of dialogue, seeking wisdom in all of their relationships, private and public. They should seek wisdom, justice, and truth, even if it exposes their own or others' ignorance. 
the ancient cultural icons as the ultimate social influencers. Sure. I mean, we can take this contemporary language and Jesus exposed the corruption of the religious leaders, both those with status and wealth and those who were obsessed about following what was in the Old Testament literally without taking into account the fact that the poor and oppressed were unable to and without any mercy or empathy. So he exposed their elitism, their um, uh, superiority complex, um, their emotional poisons, which were related to their false beliefs. Confucius exposed the corruption of the Chinese leaders. Anybody who has power, who thinks they are by nature superior to another human being is called out. I mean, all of these leaders uh, have an eye of the soul to recognize our common humanity. The golden rule, Confucius, do unto not others as you would have them do unto you. I think that Confucius says, do not do to others what you would not want done to you. But anyway, Jesus says it. I mean, it is universal. Buddha exposed the corruption of the Hindu religious leaders. They claimed to know more uh, than the masses and they demanded blind obedience. They treated other people in a way they did not want to get treated. And Muhammad exposed the corruption of the many types of religious gurus in his day. And he also almost got killed. So this is a common theme. This particular case of how to solve the problem of child marriage in Indonesia represents a pattern in the modern Western intellectual. Supposedly, they believe in equality, freedom, and human rights, but they spend mostly uh, most of their time in the office reading and writing out their own ideas and getting them published in journals and with academic presses that already adhere to that worldview. They just find their little friend group. And um, if they're savvy, they have they know which friend groups have the most prestige and they publish in the most prestigious uh, university presses and journals. And so they mold their minds to fit that. And then they are so-called successful. Um, he's not criticized by people outside of his frame of reference. He's able to and willing to criticize people he does not know as an outsider. He's supposedly a detached intellectual, knows more than the uneducated or uninformed masses. He works with the powerful to structure a society that's supposedly in the interest of the powerless without communicating with them. It's more, it's more like behavior modification, like you threaten these fathers with prison sentences or something, or big fines. He considers himself alienated from the very people he's supposedly trying to help. When, and, you know, he might also think he's trying to help this girl, this poor girl is getting married off. But if the community rejects her, and if she doesn't, if she refuses to marry the man her father wants, and she's rejected, like she's kicked out of her house and no one else will marry her. Why are you doing her a favor if she's literally on the street? Unless you want to take care of her, you have to have more understanding. You just have to have more empathy about the situation. You're not really helping her either. Right now, intellectuals are trained to gather the data about the problem. They can make the punishments more severe and use their power to enforce the laws. But this does not change people's hearts or the culture. Instead, it makes people, I would imagine it makes people more convinced that the West has corrupted their nations. It's turned them away from God, what they think of as Allah's will, and it will lead to personal and collective damnation. So there will be a backlash. If you behave like that, there will be a backlash. Instead, an influencer should listen to people's stories, post videos of people who changed their minds and why they changed their minds. Though those listening need to be able to identify with the people who changed. They do not identify with Western-style educated intellectuals. 
who have turned their back on their own traditions, who are alienated from their own societies. While I was listening to this presentation, I envisioned, envisioned a way someone could use social media to make Indonesia a better society. It would require the kind of insight of wisdom through deliberation required by Panchasila number four. One of my students at Asia University for Women in Bangladesh told me her family story. If her father were interviewed, this is what he would say. I used to think, and you could have this posted on social media, right? You're interviewing this father. I used to think I had a moral responsibility to give my daughter to a man who was motivated to become financially successful or who already came from a wealthy home. That was what Allah wanted. My daughters rejected any arranged marriage and left home to go to high school and then college. I fought against this in every way I could, but their teachers helped them and had the law on their side. If my daughters wanted to leave home, they had the legal right to when they got to a certain age. I was guilt-ridden and furious at the Westerners who first planted these ideas. The West has corrupted women everywhere. That's what I was convinced of. Then I got sick, really sick. I could no longer provide for my family. I did not anticipate this. I did not think that even if my daughters were married, their husbands would probably not want to provide for me and my family. We would be destitute. Instead, my educated daughters got good jobs and sent money home. They are not sexually promiscuous. They want to marry men who support them in their careers. Now I am convinced, completely convinced that Mohammed, bless his name, would want my daughters to be educated. It's Allah's will. I'm telling this story to try and convince everyone like me who thought he was doing his daughters a favor by keeping them ignorant and dependent on their husbands. Please reconsider. I know of husbands who abuse their wives and the wives cannot leave because they have no education or chance to support themselves. Please, in the name of Allah and Islam, send your daughters to school. You don't have to accept Western beliefs and ways of living to educate your daughters. You're just being a good Muslim. Indonesia can move forward and be faithful, even more faithful than ever before. Okay, so that's, that's how I think an ancient wisdom tradition and definitely Panchasila number four would apply in Indonesia, but I not just Indonesia, one would hope in all the developing countries. Okay, so what about number five? This is also, this issue is related to number five, the university community engagement projects and working for women's equality. When I first found out about UCE in Indonesia, I was jealous. Western civilization would be much healthier and much more democratic if professors had to direct some of their professional careers to work that would directly help their communities. I think this expectation goes back to Panchasila number one and two, religious pluralism and humanism, because it's the model of the wise person as completely engaged in public life. Intellectuals who want to preserve democracy and free speech should know they have to engage with fellow citizens in a truly meaningful way, listening to them and understanding their point of view. Only then can anyone change another's mind. But the goal should not be to change others, but to become more enlightened oneself about the lives and worldviews of fellow citizens. If your only goal in finding out about other people is you already have this agenda of how to change them, you're not going to change them. Why isn't your goal just to understand them and entertain the possibility that if you ask them, what do you think justice is? 
they could come up with a really good idea you hadn't thought of before. You can't assume you are going to enlighten these people. It's just they won't learn anything if you're not going to learn anything. It has to be an authentic engagement, a desire to come away from the engagement with everyone wiser. Everybody understands life better. Okay, so the American Philosophical Association wants professors to become more engaged with the public. They would be jealous of Indonesia. In 2020, they sent out a letter to members trying, quote, to stimulate professors to become regular contributors to public debates about matters of moral and social significance. Um, this is 2000. In May 2017, after Trump was elected, they sent out another letter. The APA values philosophers' participation in the public arena. The APA encourages departments, colleges, and universities to recognize public philosophy as a growing site of scholarly engagement, rewarding public philosophy and decisions regarding promotion, tenure, and salary. So again, they would be jealous of the expectation in Indonesia. And I certainly wish we would do this because our country would be a lot better off. We're of course plagued with polarization, but I think the professors are not only not helping the problem, I think a number of them are just as likely to be making it worse. Um, too often the best and brightest young students in the developing world go to the West to get PhDs in Western universities. They learn the cutting edge jargon related to their field. They find the small group of like-minded people who have the power to publish their work and get them jobs and status. They become alienated from their own cultural traditions and people. It looks like the APA would like to be more like Indonesia in its model of the intellectual. Indonesians also have the tradition of Gotong Royong, village uplift, that can link them to local villagers in their development of UCE projects. The US used to have more close-knit communities, but the development of technology and the shrinking middle class has led to a breakdown in community. It's also led to people who are motivated to succeed in high tech move to the city because that's where the education in high tech is. And then people in the rural areas don't get engaged in the economic system in the next wave of the economic system. So they're, they're stuck behind. And so everything they do is just the same as it's been in the past, but they depend on high tech, us succeeding in a high tech culture in order for any money to sort of trickle down <laughs> to them. But what's happened now is this huge gap between rural and urban. And I, I would guess that probably is happening in developing countries also, but I think it's misguided. I think for to have the professors who probably live in cities go out into the villages to contribute the their expertise in various ways, and I have a whole, um, I have a whole lecture on those various ways. I understand the demand that every Indonesian professor must publish with Scopus approved journals makes it difficult to preserve their own tradition. Most of the Scopus journals are very specialized. They try to use the methodologies of modern science and social science in every intellectual pursuit, including the humanities. However, poetry, literature, history, music, dance, theater, philosophy, theology, were not created as modern sciences. They weren't created to exploit nature for human well-being. They were created to educate the mind that is connected to the universe, the highest intellectual capacity that tries to integrate emotions, thoughts, and actions so we can create the most virtuous, just, and beautiful lives possible for each of us. 
with the assumption that culture and nature are integrated. The biological part of our psyches, the emotional and the action is integrated with the knowledge and we build a culture that's sustainable. So I wish all of you well in that pursuit. Um, all right, so um, the next, the next lecture will be about, this one is one aspect of inclusivity. The next one is about including atheists and also the difference between dualism and humanism in terms of emotional education, emotional. So this lecture is related to that, that the ancient view or the Greeks, really empathy was very important and empathy with what's best in us, what's worst in us, that we have these basic uh, capacities for doing good or evil. And we should understand that we should have a lot of empathy and a lot of motivation to create a flourishing society so people don't get trapped in terrible situations. Um, so the next one is about the difference between that kind of a humanist model of civilization and what Marif calls puritanical, fundamentalist, um, doctrinal. Every single tradition in Panchasila one can have a humanist or a puritan version. But because of Panchasila, if you're a good Indonesian, you would be a humanist Muslim or a humanist Hindu. But anyway, so that's that's the next. It's all related to inclusivity at this point.